With a huge amount of experimentation and risk, the bowerbirds of Papua New Guinea and Australia build theatrical stages, or bowers as they are called, to lure admirers in. Here's one. You can see the little bird here with a little berry in its beak under this extraordinary structure that is made out of twigs. And in the foreground, that's not accidental decoration. You can see the little colored leaves collection, maybe that's a bit of colored soil. It's important to note that these are not nests, but seduction pads. Check this one out. This little bowerbird obviously loved black acorns, and he's also got a couple of little colored collections underneath his structure. And what I love so much about these little architect birds is that they use materials that are found, borrowed, and stolen, and sometimes inherited from other birds, which is exactly what anyone who works with ideas does. We build on the shoulders of others, and we have now entered this time when it has never been so easy to build something. And I'm not just talking about 3D printing here, I'm talking about the whole spectrum of arts, science and technology cross-pollinating ideas. I've been invited to talk to you today because I've created a cross-platform story world that explores human immortality. It's fictional, but it's been greatly inspired by recent advances in bio and nanotechnologies. The story also touches upon history, religion, philosophy, cosmology, cybernetics, quantum physics. It has a thousand-year chronology. It's um, revisionist history, because I have characters who live a very long time, and it's also the type of science fiction that some people call speculative fiction, because a lot of the story plays out in a very near-future world. People always ask writers, where do you get your crazy ideas from? <clears throat> I've thought about this a bit, and I don't think we're that different from anyone who works in any discipline where they have to sort of put together connections and juxtapositions between things. I want to show you a couple, just two examples from biomedicine, which has become a particular favorite of mine for triggering ideas. So this is expanding kidney cells that were growing in the lab over four days. Uh, this is another example uh, from Nikon's Small World competition, and it shows the blood-brain barrier in a uh, zebrafish embryo. And for me, this perfectly demonstrates this intersection between science and arts that's happening today. Now, if you didn't know what this was, what would you think it was? When I saw this image, of course, being completely story-biased in my mind, I thought, wow, I wonder if my story world will look like that one day. So when you're creating a story that has to spread out over many media, it's, it feels a little bit like being a curator, curator of these collections of ideas. Just as the bowerbird you know, gathers together his treasures, and these ideas become your foundation document, which we call a mythology, in which you lay out the rules of your world and the overall tonality for it. And then you go looking for an overarching theme. And I just can't resist showing one of my favorite bowers. Uh, this little bird obviously decided that blue was his theme, with his sort of bottle tops and, and straws and little bits of litter. So once you've got your theme, then the best thing to do is to get together with a group of people who come from all different backgrounds, and you start talking about what the emotional touch points for your story world could be. And by that, I mean what's going, what aspects of your story are going to draw people to the story and make them want to interact with it. And when I say interaction, I mean openly inviting an audience to bring in influences from their own lives and to help expand your story. Of course, this doesn't mean that you're not going to go out with traditional media 
like a feature film or a TV series, because there's always going to be an aspect of your audience that just want to digest a single platform. They don't have the time or the inclination to go any deeper. But you are going to have audience who might fall in love with your story world, who really want to go into that story world and explore it and discover it and add to it. And I embrace this idea because I don't know about you, but I don't want to be fed a strict diet with my entertainment of what I know I'm already into. You know, I want to be introduced to things that I didn't know I was into until I am. I'm not being that original by referencing the wonders of the natural world or human invention as a trigger for a story. I mean, people have always done this. William Turner, the famous English painter, he lived during the Industrial Revolution. And his curiosity as a visual storyteller took him to walk out of his art studio one day at the Royal Academy of Arts and across into the Royal Academy of um, Sciences which in London at that time was in the very same building. And he came upon a talk about clouds, which just happened to be the birth of modern meteorology. Because until that point in time, nobody had ever thought to classify clouds. They thought they were all the same. Later, William Turner was greatly assisted in creating his masterful wave formations in his seascape paintings by listening to talks on hydrodynamics. And what makes Turner such an important figure in the art world and in the world in general is that he didn't just depict nature in all its wild luminosity, but also machinery and change. And here you can see the docks alive with industry in the middle of the night. And here is one of Turner's most famous paintings, showing a steam train racing into the future. They say that a paradigm shift happens when one conceptual world is replaced by another. And there are many people today who say that we're already in the midst of a second industrial revolution. The signs are all around us. Some days, I have to ask myself, what do you do when the speculative fiction you're working on becomes reality before you've even finished the first draft? My story begins in the Arctic, and we all know that the Northwest Passage some days seems to be melting before our very eyes. There is this tremendous responsibility that comes with writing about the near future. When you think of William Gibson, he is a very famous speculative writer in America today, and he's a master at predicting emerging technological trends. And some of his novels already read like historical fiction, even though they were only written 10 or 15 years ago. And the world today, slides, <laughs> the world today is not just facing climate change, but also rapidly facing machine intelligence, molecular nanotechnologies, advances in synthetic biology, and the development of new weapon systems. If we are to survive this critical period of time, we need awareness. It's a mistake to think that the near future rests solely in the hands of scientists and technologists. Every one of us has to ask who is going to own these emerging technologies, and what problems may they create as well as solve? It's been over a century now since writers have been questioning technological and scientific advances. And yet it always amazes me when I think that there's still so many people out there who think that science fiction as a genre is still a little bit dubious, you know? as if it's all about black leather and tentacles and deep space operatics, when really, at its best, science fiction is all about asking just one pretty simple question, and that is, how far can we stretch ourselves and still remain human? The Japanese have an expression, and that is, the only thing guaranteed never to change is change itself.
because they have to live in this country with constant earthquakes. But we all know that change can be very frightening. People resist it, they want to cling to the familiar. People certainly don't want to be lectured about the near future. They want to be seduced. And here I thought you deserved to see the female bowerbird, the one that the man spends so much effort trying to entertain. I think she has quite a discerning look in her eye. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that she's an easy woman to convince. But when you think of the bowerbird, he doesn't just construct this amazing bower, but he also does a live performance which sort of consists of a bit of a swagger and a song. Sometimes he has a prop, you know, it's something he's found in the rubbish and he'll put it in his beak and he'll toss it up and put it down again. And the reason he goes to all this effort is because he is absolutely driven by this urge to woo this woman up into his bower and boogie. And what I love so much about cross-platform storytelling is that we don't have to choose. We don't have to choose between the physical and the virtual experiences. We can have both. A couple of years ago, you might be asking why I've got this image here, I'm about to tell you. A couple of years ago, I presented a pitch for this cross-platform idea I had, in which characters sent knitted clues to one another. And afterwards, this elderly producer came up to me and he said, ah, Anna, there you are, thank you, that was unusual. Um, I just have to say that I, I completely panicked when you said the word knitting because I thought this must be some new tech term I haven't yet heard about. And then I went, oh no, this woman means knitting. And of course I did. <laughs> and my initial response was to feel a little bit embarrassed that I was referencing such an old-fashioned craft and one that so many people still perceive as being a purely feminine pursuit. And then I thought, no, I know this little story point here has the potential to hit the zeitgeist because according to the worldwide blogosphere, knitting is the third most popular subject after fishing and gardening. So there is this tremendous return to the homegrown and the homemade. But this conversation with this producer did get me thinking about the words knitting and weaving and how beautifully they describe what we're doing with arts and technology today. So if the printing press was all about fostering the individual author, then these emerging technologies have to be about collaboration. And coming back to my favorite bird one more time, you know, his motto has to be, build it and they will come. And like him, we can all be makers and risk takers. So let's use these emerging technologies to create stories that jolt us into other ways of seeing, that, you know, give us the courage to rub up against the new and add to it ourselves. Together, we can weave a collaborative vision of the future. Thank you.